If you want to invest in a startup and make that sweet 100x return like the big VCs, but you don't know what to look for, then I've got a treat for you. My next guest is about to teach you some of his strategies that he deploys in his venture fund in his pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Jeff Gardner. Jeff is an executive chairman overseeing five high growth companies, leveraging his extensive expertise. Additionally, as a partner of Springtime Ventures, as well as the author of the newest leadership book called Love Your People. Previously, Jeff served as the CEO of Zen Planner, where he orchestrated the development of an exceptional team and fostered a high performance culture, resulting in a remarkable compound annually exceeding the growth rate of 50 percent. His background includes executive roles in technology and payment firms with notable tenures where he managed $2 billion in global business. So what does this mean? This means that Jeff is about to teach you all the cheat codes on how to enter God mode as a leader, an investor, and a top-tier asset manager in the alternative asset space. So Jeff, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's such a wonderful podcast. You know, I love the variety of guests that you bring onto the show. Uh, and the discipline that you put into putting together a great show with real actions that people can take away. You know, a lot of these, you can get a little bit of, you know, ear candy or, you know, a little snack. Uh, you're delivering a full meal. There you go. That's right. So we're, we've been fortunate enough to be in the top 2% in the world. And it's all because of amazing guests just like you. And yes, it's been a labor of love. And uh, we want to just decentralize a lot of the wisdom and just let people know that uh, this is not a language that only wealthy people or the elite Wall Street people speak, that you can learn this stuff too. And you are certainly one of those voices uh, bringing that to the people. So enough being said, let's jump right into it, man. So uh, with some beginners, you've been a beginner, I've been a beginner, maybe in your industry, entrepreneurship, venture capital, all of these things that you've done, you've done some huge things and you're just getting started. What can you teach beginners on A, how to win and B, how not to lose when you're starting out in this journey? Yeah, there's there's so much to unpack there, particularly because I've been a beginner on, as an entrepreneur, you know, starting businesses and now a beginner as an investor. Uh, so let's talk about what it takes to win. And, you know, first of all, when I'm looking to make an investment these days, uh, I'm looking for a team, a leader, a CEO that is really motivated. I want to make sure they're solving a problem uh, and that they're pure and committed to seeing it all the way through to the end. And, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times as we look at these businesses, you know, what we're looking for is somebody with that full commitment. We see a lot of immigrants and first time founders really tend to outperform the peers uh, because they really want it bad. So that's one of the things we look for. We look for companies that demonstrate fiscal responsibility. So we don't want folks that are out there just seeing how much cash that they can burn. Um, you know, raising capital is not the end game. The end game is building a great business. Uh, raising capital is just a necessity to get there. And then we look for businesses uh, that have you know really strong gross margins. You know we look at eighty uh, percent. I focus largely in tech uh, and eighty percent for software businesses. And then if we look at something more in the tech enabled services, you know we like to see gross margins in the sixty five percent or higher category. Awesome, man. So and then carrying on on that second component, on the second element is to say when you're starting out, it's not enough just to get some early points on the board. Yes, you need to do that. But also, you can really make some pretty fatal mistakes in the early days as a venture capitalist. So what would you tell people who are aspiring to be a venture capitalist? What are some ways, what are some things that you can, cautionary tales you can give people? Uh, not only can you, but you know, most of us do make those mistakes <laughs> along the way. Uh, when we look at you know, things that we've seen that have just not worked out well for us, and we've spoken to other venture capitalists and, and they see the same thing. Uh, you, you know, in this day and age, you know, post COVID, we're a lot of remote teams. We just find that when teams are together, working together, particularly when you're building something new, uh, having them in that same location where they can collaborate, they can get together, it just speeds the cycle of building and creating so much better. And we're just seeing them be much, much more effective uh, than highly dispersed teams. Uh, we like teams that are really diverse. And so, you know, everybody wants to start a company with their drinking buddy or their college roommate or somebody that's, you know, very much like them. It, we look for a really rounded team. So somebody who's really strong in tech, somebody who's really strong in go-to-market, somebody who's really, you know, great from a marketing perspective. So we want to see that diversity in that team that comes together in a solid way. Uh, notice that most of what I'm talking about is a team. So we definitely bet on the jockey 
uh, and we see it time and time again. And then somebody that has experience. So, you know, you, you see a lot of dramatized movies of the first time entrepreneur who just knocks it out of the park. That tends to be the exception rather than a rule. It, we see folks who have gone through some hard times, some difficulty, some person, something they've had to persevere through. Uh, and those are the folks that we've seen have that grit and that determination to be very successful. Okay, perfect. So when you do an investment, do you have any discipline to look back, for example? Do you, do you look back on investments and performance and analyze that or do, do we just soldier forward? How do you guys treat that? We, we have a formalized day twice a year where all the partners get together and we go through and stack ranks or the investments that we have, how they're performing. And then we correlate sort of what there's different aspects of the business we look at, you know, whether it's market, whether it's industry, the leadership teams, and we assess all those different components to see what is making the winning investments for us. Uh, and that helps guide us. And we continue to look at that and refine that uh, every, every six months. So it sounds like, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like it's, it's really good to define what success looks like before you do the investment so that on the end, or we'll call it look back analysis or after action report, you can actually say, all right, when we started, before we ever cut any money into this deal, we said, if this is how it plays out, that is successful. You go back to your charter documents, you blow the dust off and say, all right, what did we say? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Found the document. Let's look back. Did it perform the way that we expected? Yes or no. And if no, then you go, I'm assuming you go into some further analysis to figure out why did it not achieve our expectations? Is that right? Yeah, Ryan, that, that's a great summary. So when we're analyzing that initial investment, we have a matrix where we go through the criteria and our confidence level in those criteria. And then we have a debate as, a, as, a, as an investment team as far as, you know, do we think it's, this is going to be a good investment? Uh, and we're looking for a unanimous agreement that, you know, that is the right investment. And we want to make sure it's going to be a fun returner, right? There are plenty of businesses and entrepreneurs shouldn't get disappointed when their business doesn't get funded by somebody. And the nature of venture capital is that you're looking for fun returners. So you may be able to build a great business, a good solid business, but uh, we're looking for, you know, the home runs. Yeah. With that same note, do you have a typical hold period that you guys like to stay in the deal? Uh, so I'm we're a 10-year fund. So depending on, we make our initial investments in the first four years uh, of each fund. And then uh, beyond that, then we do add-on, follow-on investments, you know, if the opportunities arise and the, and the business is performing well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that is, that, that's our approach for, for investing. It's a 10 year fund. Perfect. Okay. So we got look back analysis. we got all these cool things just some advice to beginners. If you're starting out, you want to make sure that you're effectively picking the right jockeys and then also not doing these silly things that can mess up your deals or really just screw that up. And finally, very good discipline. That's how I know you're one of the good ones is you do a look back analysis to say, I don't care how much money we made or lost. That should not deter us from actually doing a look back analysis. We want to make sure that we're constantly getting better as well. So it's not just our port codes or our entrepreneurs that we've invested in that we expect to get better. We also expect to get better and better as we go along. That's absolutely right. And, and it's funny. I think our biggest learnings have come from those failed investments and going back through and looking at why they failed. And it is, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's so enlightening to, to do that. And I'd recommend everybody go through that process. Yeah. Wasn't it, I think it was Nelson Mandela where I never lose, I either win or I learn. So having that, go. having that operational discipline to use an MBA term, an operational discipline that just says, this is how it is around here. This is a standard. We either win or we learn. And so thank you for being one of those companies and, and those investors that actually make sure that no matter what, we will always pull the lessons out and get better and better as we go along. I love that. So now as we invest, some of that has to do with the market. So I'm really curious. We can't have a show making billions out talking about economics. That's, right. That's right. So um, in the market, I'm just curious, uh, what are you seeing out there as, as a venture capitalist? What uh, What's tickling your toes right now? Yeah, you know, we see thousands and thousands of deals uh, per year, and you know, it, it it takes something special to get us to that level. Where we're really digging in and doing deep due diligence. I'll tell you right now that you know the competition for deals is increasing for you know what I call Class A assets. So these are businesses, you know, they they have a product market set, they have doubt in their ideal customer profile, they know who they're going after, and they have a strong management team. 
you know, those assets are commanding very good valuations and they're getting very competitive. Uh, and, and so that's that's nice to see, you know, from a, an entrepreneur standpoint, you know, you know what you need to build to, to get to get a great investment. The thing that, you know, I'm, everybody's talking about now that we have to talk about is AI, right? Any investment that we are considering today, we look at it through two lenses. We look at it through can this business be disrupted by AI in the future? So therefore, you know, is it a risk if we make an investment right now that, you know, we, that we lose and this thing does not go the way we'd like it to? And then the flip side of that is what opportunities do they have to utilize AI to disrupt the market? And so one is defensive, obviously one is offensive. And there's some great offensive opportunities where there are not leaders in these industries, a lot of these industries. And so, you know, it's looking, you know, sort of way back when, you know, the internet and these, there's some great new businesses coming. And what we're seeing and what is very interesting is AI focused on specific industries or niches. So, you know, a lot of time is spent talking about, you know, the, the, the big generative AI models, the big uh, large language models, and what we like is specific application. So there may be security concerns in a certain industry or things like that, where if you got a leading company that has an AI component, they can really sort of take a, uh, a first mover advantage. Awesome. And, you know, uh, uh, another topic next to AI is vitamin D or what I like to call, some people call it debt. So I'm just curious on the debt markets as far as funding deals or people seeking capital. What, what are you seeing out there? Yeah. So, I mean, debt, obviously it's, it's expensive right now. Uh, and it, especially with companies without a lot of recurring revenue or a lot of assets, it is extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. And so I'd say in our earlier stage companies, you know, the, the, the seed and a you know, we're doing mostly equity anyway, yeah. uh, because they don't have a lot of you know collateral for the debt. But even in companies that are much further along and have the ability to do debt, we are getting much more opportunities to invest equity, just because it's it's you know that that gap has closed between expected equity returns and expected debt returns, and uh, and we're seeing a lot of opportunity with equity. All right. Well, that sounds like a balanced market, Uh, even though we don't like when our capital is expensive, but we'll we'll certainly work with that. So it sounds like, in your opinion, what you're seeing is expensive debt. We kind of know that. Going, you took it a step further and says, but what that is, you keep me honest here, Jeff, but what that is doing is it's actually shifting people to prefer raising equity a lot more than uh, debt like they used to. Before it was so cheap, it was basically free. Let's go get debt. And now they're like, eh, hang on. There's payments, there's restricted covenants, there's all kinds of stuff. Plus the extra costs. I don't know. Maybe we do go to equity. Is that what we're, is that what you're seeing out there? Absolutely. And, and I would say, you know, not only is the cost so high, it's the, the covenants are just so much tighter than they were, you know, two, three years ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's that could be a, a barometer of uh, some of the systemic risks that we're seeing in the market. And, and banks or traditional lenders are also throwing in a, a few extra restrictive covenants. If you want their money, you got to play by their rules, right? So that's right. I love that. Now, that's just today. But we all know finance often trades around and multiples trade around. What are we expecting around the corner. We all get paid to look around corners and run through walls. Sounds like a fun job. But uh, where do you, where's the smart money going? Where do you see the market going and, and where's the money following? Yeah, it's just, you know, there's so much uncertainty in the market right now with, uh, you know, the elections in the fall, you know, what's going to happen with, you know, we, th- we thought we saw a nice trend on inflation to lower some interest rates, but there's still just a lot of questioning as far as what's going to happen. So, we are seeing again for top assets those valuations. Uh, you know, we're we're seeing some really you know high multiples, not 2021 high. I mean, not in the in the 20s, uh, but we're seeing you know sort of just over low double digits for really good assets on a revenue multiple. And again, my focus is on technology, so we're talking you know specifically on on, on technology investments here. Mm-hmm. What kind of questions do you ask yourself? Like going forward, what do you look for when you're looking at AI? If you have a business that is, that's it, it, very logical to be disrupted by AI. So whether it's, you know, it's ed tech or it's uh, a language business or things like that, where you know that, you know, there is an AI component. The, the question is not if, it's just when mm. and how you will engage with the AI. So I've seen companies that are what I would call in sort of at-risk markets uh, from an AI disruption. 
And they have really taken an offensive approach and said, listen, our industry that we're in is going to change. And we are sitting in the driver's seat to be able to drive that change. So really taking control of it and building sort of the frameworks and the infrastructure and infrastructure around it to make it very successful. Mm. So we, we, we love seeing folks that are, that, that are, that are, not in denial, because it's easy to sort of try and stick your head in the sand. And the ones that are taking it, embracing it, and want to be the, the drivers of, of that innovation. Got it. As we round third base, you have so much experience. You've been managing $2 billion in business, and you've done a lot, and you are doing a lot. So with that, and I know you've written a book, so I'm just curious. Nobody writes a book without having some really cool things to talk about. So we'll see if I can squeeze some of this out of Jeff, folks. But I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share some of the principles out of your book and just help our listeners to gain a competitive advantage from your experience. So if someone asked you, hey, what what's some of the best advice you can give me right now? I'm starting out either as an entrepreneur or I'm learning to be a venture capitalist. What competitive advantage can you give them today? Yeah, uh, I, I would love to share that. So, you know, the book, uh, again, is called Love Your People, and it's really an entrepreneurial leadership system. And so one of the things I found in working with uh, a lot of CEOs, and, and so, you know, we've done 50 venture capital investments. I've done a lot outside of the venture capital firm. And then I've worked with a lot of late stage, later stage businesses where we take them from 5 million in revenue uh, to 50 million in revenue. And so through that sort of full cycle of experiences, there are things that just sort of bubble to the top and say, listen, here's what makes a great entrepreneurial leader and a great leadership team and ultimately a great company and great culture where we feel really excited to invest in this type of company. Uh, so the book talks about 10 dimensions. Uh, I, I will share, I'm not going to w- walk you through all 10 of those, but I'll share three right now. So the first is to make sure that we have a, you have a really clear vision. Uh, and I think Andreessen Horowitz talks about this as well, but being able to, so many entrepreneurs have it in their head and they think it's so obvious to everybody around them, but it's not. Especially as you grow and you start scaling, you got to be able to articulate this to you know the new team members you're recruiting, uh, the inv- new investors you're bringing on board, your partners. So getting that vision really crisp. And, and I talk about the vision really having three components. So w- your purpose, why you exist, the values. So, so what are the behaviors and, and the way you're going to act as a company to achieve your purpose? Uh, and then I look for a specific mission. And this is not a mission statement. This is, think of it as a military mission. Like we're going to conquer that mountain. Um, this is, you know, in three years, we are going to have X percent of market share. We're going to be the market leader or whatever. Maybe you'll be very specific as far as what it is you're going after. And you measure your performance to achieve that mission. So vision is number one. Um, yeah, I'll share uh, something that goes pretty closely with that is, uh, is, is setting clear expectations for exceptional performance. And so we see our best companies, they share with us, here are our expectations uh, for the business for the next quarter. Uh, and then at the end of that quarter, they share how they actually perform. So it's that full circle of accountability. And the folks that I work with, we talk about the big three. So what are the three things that you are going to be doing this quarter to move this business in the direction where you want to take it to, to utilize, to, to achieve your vision. And so it could be things like, you know, your, your quarterly revenue target. It could be, listen, we want to improve our margins, our gross margins from, you know, 80 to 85%. Uh, and here are the things we're going to do. It could be sort of the logo targets. It, it could be just about anything. We're going to launch a new product and that has to go out by the specific date. So getting really specific on what exceptional performance looks like uh, and measuring your results to that performance that you're committing to. And then the, the last one I'll share with you uh, as well is, um, you know, we love to see companies that have established a culture of innovation. So a, a lot of early stage companies, they think about getting that initial product out there, that initial thing in the marketplace. And that's not what we want to see. We want to see this continuous, you know, we talked about continual learning earlier, this continuous culture of innovation where these companies have built processes and there are ways to do this really methodically and very disciplined, you know, quarterly release targets. You can have design sprints. There's ways to make this happen so it is built into the DNA of the company. And so therefore, this is not a one and done. This is a company that is going to continue to innovate uh, and evolve. And you know, in my opinion, I think you know Amazon is probably you know the the one to hold out there as far as creating new revenue generating opportunities time and time again. 
Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. I remember, uh, and I'm sure my listeners will keep me honest if I'm misinformed, but I remember hearing a, a little rumor, and maybe this is true, maybe it's not, but it's still a great idea is, I believe it was Google that says about 20% of your time should be spent on kind of passion projects or something around Google, which allows people not only to have, to be a little bit happier, but it also a lot of innovation. And I know a lot of products have come out from employees just kind of tinkering. And so having that culture of innovation, even if you really dial it in to say 20% of your time should just be thinking about cool stuff and how your talents can bring new ideas into the world. So I absolutely love that. that that's right, Ryan. The, the, the one piece of guidance I would have around that is, you know, Google is, as we all know, is massive and extremely profitable. For earlier stage companies that you and I and most of your listeners are, are engaged with, make sure that innovation is focused. Uh, so, you know, give them a challenge to go solve rather than just having sort of blue sky where you can go after and do anything, uh, but giving some specific sort of guide rails to let folks go innovate and really solve the problems your customers are facing right now. All right. Spoken like a true pro. Now, here, here's a question that I get asked a lot when I'm speaking at conferences, and I'm sure you do too. And that is great. Like we all talk about upside. Yeah, how do you know? And what do you invest in? What metrics do you look for? Great. Sure. We could tell you that. But what a lot of VCs don't tell you is what if you were wrong? What if you made an investment and it looked amazing, right? You went through your process, everything checked out, but for some weird reason, this company's not performing. So my question for you, Jeff, is how do you know when it's time to cut a portfolio company from your portfolio? Yeah, it's, you know, a, a lot of the companies we invest in with Springtime Ventures are seed. And so a lot of them just the, the, by the nature of it, are, they're not all going to make it right. And so for us, when we decide when, you, when they get to that stage and they need more money and we have to decide whether we're going to write another check or whether we're going to walk away. One of the first things we look at, you know, are they delivering on the commitments they've made? And if not, you know, why happens they? So one thing that we see is consistent is that, you know, great leaders and great teams, they find a way to deliver on their commitments. And yes, there's times you're not going to get the market right. Software or, or technology takes more time to develop than you think it will. But, but what are the commitments they've made and what kind of progress have they made towards those commitments? So I'd say that's sort of the, the, the first part of the scorecard that we look at as far as whether we want to continue on or not. Mm -hmm. Um, another is just, this is, seems so simple and so obvious, but it becomes such a challenge. It is transparency during tough times. Mm -hmm. And so CEOs and executive teams, you know, great leaders get more transparent when times are tough and when things are off track. Uh, and poor leaders, they tend to hide. Uh, so you'll see, you know, your investment updates, you know, they keep getting further and further apart. Uh, they become more and more vague. And, you know, they're not as honest, like they're, they're painted through, you know, this, this really nice rosy colored uh, viewpoint. And what we want is we want the gritty truth. We want to know exactly what's going on. And we want to, to hear it more often rather than less. Uh, so, so if things are going bad and you're an entrepreneur, don't run and hide from it. Use your board, use your investors, share the information, and then they're more likely to be there to support you along the way. And then, you know, are they making, you know, the right decisions, the hard call? So if things are off track or not going the way they want and you've got, you know, to take an example, like, you know, sales are just off track, right? They're just not working. You know, you, you've hired your, your best friend uh, to be head of sales and, and now it's just not delivering. Are they going to, is, is that CEO making the right call to let that person go and to hire a rock star, you know, head of sales to get in there? Or are they sort of, you know, the, the wartime situation where they just freeze up in the field and they're not making the hard calls? So we want to see that they're good with decision making and they're making the right decisions. And, and then lastly is capital efficiency. So we want to see the, the money that they've been provided. How have they used it? How are they continuing to use it? And what are uh, the, what are the investments you know they, they want to continue to make in the business uh, going forward, which becomes a key part of our decision making. Yeah, that's, you're a man after my heart. So I'm a, I'm a recovering CFO, and you know capital efficiency is a big one. And and I love everything that you've said as well as we're saying it's important. It's not the only thing, but it's up there next to oxygen, right? So it's capital efficiency and just how you manage and run the business. I think is what we're talking about. 
And, you know, one of the things I remember, um, on one of the engagements, we'll say, I can't say what company, but it was one of the, the companies I was with. They were, they had to dip into a line of credit to get through payroll every month. And then, then they would get their payables and there's this huge tsunami every month of cash and it would pay it off. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, we got a working capital problem. You should not be, you should be able to self-sustain your operations. If you don't, we have an issue. And so just I'll, I'll fast forward the story and get right to the signal here. So folks, if, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to go to me or you want to go to Jeff, we're going to, I'm going to look for a couple of things and arguably not so much on seed, but later on in a business is working capital, making sure you have that dialed in, making sure your cash conversion cycle is dialed in and your working capital turnover ratio. So those are the things I look for, right? You're just, you're just talking for me. That's three of probably 250 things that I look at. And I'm reminded of, uh, I'm old enough uh, to remember this on Price is Right. And they had this game, I think it was called Plinko or something. You drop it in and there's a bunch of pegs and this ball just moves left and right as it works its way down. And so I always pictured operations the same way is you got a dollar of revenue that comes in and then it it plinkos its way through the operations and profit drops out the bottom. Hopefully <laughs> better eventually. And so when, when you have this game of, of you drop a dollar in number one is how fast can it move its way through the operations and drop out through the other side? And then number two is, and how much drops out the bottom. Now in this one place that I was able to support and to help turn this company around, the answer was nothing dropped out the bottom. They needed debt to supplement it because it wasn't coming out. And so it was so complicated and the timing of cash flows was off and it was making this whole problem. And so helping that. And now if you don't have that dialed in, venture capitalists are here. We are here to help you. We do want you to succeed. Our money and reputation is tied up with you too. So working capital, cash conversion cycle and working capital turnover ratio. Those are very, very good metrics, especially if you're later stage. Those are great metrics to say, how's the operations doing? Is the operations, is the machine effective. Do you get good gas mileage out of this thing or is it a gas guzzler? Is it a cash guzzler or is it cash efficient? So is there anything you could add to that as well from what you guys do at Springtime? Yeah, that, that is great, Ryan. So it's uh, along those lines of sort of the working capital, working capital efficiency. So most of the tech businesses we're involved with have a recurring revenue component. And so we look at something called the magic number, which is basically the money you had invested in your go-to-market activities, you know, your sales and your marketing teams and your investment and, you know, your Google AdWords and all those divided by, and then on the numerator is the new AR for the quarter. So you look at, you know, your investment in go-to-market versus how much revenue you're generating. And you can look this up online, you know, look for the magic number uh, for recurring revenue businesses. It's great. And we're looking for something that's one or greater. So that's, that's showing us that the investments we're making, you know, in the sales and marketing organization are returning for future growth for the business, Got which it. is which is huge. It becomes a little less uh, clear when you're talking about, you know, earlier stage tech and, you know, you're building and it may be a longer before it actually results in revenue. So a couple of things we do look at. One is, you know, customer NPS and that promoter score. I think it was, I think it was Bain that came up with it originally. But the idea is, you know, you ask your customers on a scale of one to 10, the likelihood to, of recommending uh, to a friend or colleague. And when we see products that are 30 or more, we feel, we feel good about that. When we see them that are getting a score of 50 or more, that is really exciting for us. And those are really good products that, that, that we feel we want to continue to invest behind. And then we look at retention of customers. So, you know, one of the things, one, there's a bunch of different ways to look at retention, but, you know, we look at net revenue retention. So if we look at, you know, our customers from the beginning, beginning of the year, and then we look at them again at the end of the year, that bucket of customers, we want to see that they're... Uh, net revenue retention is 105% is, is in a good range. Uh, if we see them 110% or more, we find that really exciting. And so what that means is they're taking the customer base that they have and they're offering them more services and more value that the customer is willing to pay for. And that is the sign of a good long-term business. Awesome, man. So we have a, we have a few things that we cover. So just make sure that the company, the ROI, it performs as expected. Typically, what you said earlier is just make sure there's a clear vision and just a culture of performance, right? So, and, and excellence around that performance. So you just want to make sure they have clear quarterly goals. The second one that you mentioned was just set clear expectation. So that could be revenue targets, logo targets, whatever that might be. You want to, and then also showcase, if you're pitching Jeff or me or someone, showcase that your company that you've built has a culture of innovation. And then finally, one of the last things that Jeff talked about is what are some of the things you look for 
when to cut your losses. And that is they're not delivering on any of their comments. When times get tough, the leaders don't communicate. They get less transparent. They're not making the hard calls. And the capital is just not being well managed, whether it's through cash conversion cycle, working capital, the magic number, net promoter score. There were so many things that we covered. Would you say that's a fair summary? That is a great summary. Awesome, man. So before we wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like to share? Anything at all? Maybe how to find your book or how to connect with you? Anything at all? Sure. Uh, so I love when people connect with me. Uh, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, so it's Jeff Gardner. Uh, I have a monthly newsletter out there called the CX10 Initiative. Uh, so it focuses on the 10 leadership dimensions and you know, would love to be able to share that information. And, uh, and, and we've been getting great feedback that it's helping you know, a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, and then secondly, you can uh, get my book by going to my website, which is the CX10Initiative.com. Uh, again, cx10initiative.com. And if you go to order my book, uh, click on the purchase from the publisher and you can get a 20% off with the code billions. Uh, it's capital B billions. Thank you for the time, Ryan. It was uh, wonderful having this conversation and uh, and, and debating uh, the, the equity markets. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So just to synthesize the conversation is you want to make sure that businesses, whether it's your own or the companies you're investing in, make sure you understand how operations look through financial statements. We've given you a ton of metrics to, to apply to that and look out for AI. Make sure that you understand the questions to ask is, will this company get disrupted by AI? If the answer is yes, and they don't have a path forward, maybe not the best one. And the other one is, will this company do the disrupting through AI? That's another good one. Watch your debt and make sure your numbers are good. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. 